So I'm going to call the meeting to order. This is meeting number five. Today's Monday, May 9th of 2022. I'm Councillor William Riley, and I'll be the chair of tonight's meeting. Um, just a note to members of the public, due to the efforts to contain the spread of COVID-19 and to protect all individuals, the council chambers will not be open to the public to attend a standing committee or, and or council meeting until further notice. The public may submit comments for matters that are on the agenda to Jay Dyson at westlincoln.ca before 4.30 p.m. on the day of the meeting. Comments submitted will be considered as public record and will be read into the public record. Sorry, public information that will be read into the public record. This meeting will be live streamed and recorded and available on the township's website. So for those of us, or for those of you at home, you probably already know it's being live streamed, but we just note that for the public there. I will note that uh, our land acknowledgement that the township of West Lincoln being a part of the Niagara region situated on the treaty land. The land is steeped in the rich history of the First Nations, such as the Hadawinawak and the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe, uh, including the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation. There are many First Nations, the Métis and the Inuit people from across Turtle Island that live and work in Niagara today. The Township of West Lincoln, as part of the regional municipality of Niagara, stands with all of its Indigenous people, past and present, in promoting the wise stewardship of the lands on which we live. And at this point, I'll mention that, I guess, as of right now, uh, we have quorum, we have, oh, and we have Councillor Rayner, and we're just waiting on Councillor Yonker. We assume he's showing up shortly. And I'll go to members of the, uh, the council here uh, to see if there's any disclosure of pecuniary interest and or conflict of interest. Not seeing or hearing any tonight. We have no public meetings. I'll ask members of committee here if there's any changes in order of items on the agenda. Not seeing or hearing any. So we have three appointments tonight. The first appointment is from Simon, who is Smithville resident, and it's regarding Stampack noise concerns, and it's for information. So Simon, if you could... Uh, Unmute your, uh, I, I see your, your name here on the window here, so if you can unmute yourself. Um, your, the floor is yours to begin your presentation. Hey, William, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Hey, I'm good, thank you. Thank you uh, for having me at this meeting, everybody. Hey, uh, I'm just calling to uh, reiterate like the, the fact that uh, Stanpack and its uh, ongoing uh, noise problem that's uh, plaguing the town of Smithville. Um, I've read the report. Uh, I believe it's like the town, I forget exactly what it's called, the uh, town, the Planning Building Environmental Committee. Um, there's already been a report uh, sent out that is um, trying to reconcile uh, the impact um, that this is having on the community. Um, so to save my rant about what Stanpak's doing and their noise and all that, um, I believe there's a, an effort put in place by Stanpak to build a structure around uh, the cyclone machine that is um, to try and mitigate the, uh, mitigate the noise that's um, being uh, emitted by the machine. Um, Stampax uh, requested uh, to waive uh, various fees. I, I believe they're called, uh, what is it? Uh, to waive the, uh, the minor variance fee and building permit fee. Um, I think it's uh, at a cost of $6,000 to the community. It's not a direct cost, it's just uh, a matter of waiving the fee. Um, considering how long this uh, noise disturbance has been going on in Smithville um, and that stand pack, there's been a multiple sound, or there's been like sound testing um, against, or uh, for the machine that has shown uh, that stand pack is uh, within the provincial, uh, the provincial limits, or uh, yeah, the, pro yeah, the provincial limits. And uh, I guess essentially they don't really have to do anything. However, the test was completed um, with the wind blowing directly away from the sensors. Uh, it was, I, I believe, Stanpak paid for this uh, third-party testing. Um, like right now, it is it is in limits as per the test, but I, I don't believe the test was uh, completed in the worst-case scenario. But anyway, uh, besides the point, Stanpak is taking the initiative to, uh, to fix this and... Uh, and they simply just want the uh, town council to waive the, uh, the, the, the associated fees. And I don't, I don't, I don't uh, see that there's any reason that uh, the town shouldn't uh, unanimous, unanimously vote uh, in favor of this request uh, from Stanpak. Excellent. Thank you, Simon. Um, is there anything other uh, else that you'd like to add uh, during your presentation here? Uh, 
nothing at the moment. Okay. And just to let you know how it's, um, what's going to happen here. So right now we have your presentation. We'll have two other presentations, but two different matters. And the item you're referring to is item 10.1 and that's under staff report. So some point probably within the next hour, we'll eventually get to that item and uh, council will discuss that fulsome. But I, I, I certainly hear your, your concerns. Um, both council get in and I, um, have been inundated for the last couple of years with similar concerns. We've tried to do everything we can from our, um, our position. So I think, you know, I agree with you. It's basically what I'm saying. I think what's being asked here is reasonable and hopefully the rest of the committee will feel the same when the time comes to, uh, to vote on the matter. So as far as, um, anything goes, uh, the, that item will be addressed, like I said, probably within the next hour or so. And, uh, and if you like, you're welcome to stick around and, and see how that, uh, how all that uh, happens there. So if, sure, uh, if thank that, you very much. Oh, no problem. Um, I see Councillor Yonker is in. Um, so welcome, Councillor Yonker. And uh, you haven't missed much. Thank just, you. We just, <laughs> nope, sorry. We just had the first presentation. It was very brief. So you, you haven't missed much. Um, we're going to be moving forward to item P4422, Karen Al uh, Alexander, uh, and it's regarding the Invasive Species Center. It's a European water chestnut in the Welland River, and it's a presentation PowerPoint. So if uh, Karen or representatives from the uh, Invasive Species Center would like to uh, unmute themselves and uh, make their screen available to us, the floor is yours. Mr. Chair, I don't think Karen's here yet from what I can see. Okay, so if we, um, Kevin, can we just look and see if they've come in through the gallery somehow? Uh, sometimes the attendees so we, okay so we're not seeing anybody there all right so what we'll do is we'll just park that for now if we'll give them the we'll go forward to our next appointment and see if they show up in the meantime um, at this point I'm gonna ask David Hayworth uh, official plan policy plan policy consultant of Niagara region um, if you would like to make his PowerPoint presentation at this time good evening I'll uh share my screen just one second okay can everybody see the presentation looks good yes we can okay great thank you uh good evening um chair mayor council staff and public i'm happy to update you on the proposed niagara official plan the niagara official plan has taken a balanced approach with respect to growth management Niagara is made up of unique communities, which all had to be considered in the development of the Niagara Football Plan. Hmm. Just having a little trouble advancing this. So it looks like there's a little arrow to your right there. If you click that, that might go uh, to the right of your cursor there. If you keep going over, there's a little right arrow. Do you want to give that a click? Keep going. Yeah, if you just oh, click. right there. Ah, yeah. oh, there. Okay, oh. usually I'm used to using the laptop. Maybe. It might have just moved mm -hmm. you over. So if you go up to the top, actually, I'm seeing your screen here, where it says 1 slash 24, if you click that down arrow, I think that's going to put you in business. So a little bit more over to your left. Oh, yeah. Great. Try that one. There oh, we go. there we go. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, there are key interest areas to address in the Niagara official plan. We want to improve our natural environment system mapping and policies. We want a re policy response to climate change. We want to improve our housing mix. We want to increase our supply of housing of all types, but particularly on a regional basis, uh, more uh, medium and higher density housing development to help address age in place and housing affordability. Want to improve our economic competitiveness by protecting employment areas and ensuring a viable agricultural community. And then we want to have a clear policy planning framework. We plan in a two-tier planning system and we want clear policies to try and minimize overlap and confusion between uh, regional and, and local planning programs. It is important for the region to provide a consistent set of growth numbers, as well as defined boundaries for transportation, water, wastewater, planning and development charges in order to plan for growth to ensure people can travel to and from work efficiently, servicing can accommodate growth and growth can pay for growth. The 
policies of the of the official plan are built on pillar statements derived from theming of areas of public interest from broad based consultation. And these pillar statements were confirmed through surveying of regional council members. This slide depicts the core chapters and sections of the Niagara official plan. Additionally, there's an introduction, introduction chapter, an implementation chapter, site-specific policy chapters, schedules and appendices that form part of the official plan. Climate change is a section that represents the policy integration within the plan. It pulls together policy directions throughout the plan in, in other sections that directly or indirectly help address uh, our changing climate. And these examples are shown on the slide. This climate change section also commits to further strategy work, such as a greening strategy, climate modeling, and an adaptation strategy. In its simplest form, the Niagara official plan identifies what we will protect, how and where we grow, and the systems that provide for to assist with growth management and protecting our resources. In terms of what we protect, our re the resources are important to pre protect from an ecological perspective, a climate change perspective, food supplies, perspective or heritage or economic perspective or importance to the economy. For the purposes of this presentation, I'll highlight the natural environment system and agricultural policy. Regional Council selected option 3C among the environmental options being the most stringent option. And this system includes key hydrologic features, Key natural heritage features are woodlands or wetlands. Provincial, the provincial natural heritage system, which is found outside of the settlement area boundaries, linkages and buffers, and supporting features and areas and, and enhancement areas. This slide depicts one of the schedules of the official plan and identifies further the extent of coverage of our natural environment system and the features within it, and also identifies the types of features that the NES policies address. This slide identifies the agricultural land base map uh, with, on the, in the regional official plan. Uh, identifies the specialty crop, prime agricultural areas and rural lands. Of course, we have the Niagara Scarpment Plan area as well. And the policies of plan aim to protect our agricultural land base, minimize fragmentation, support the agricultural economy with agriculture related uses on farm diversified uses, and limit uh, severances to rural areas uh, where they, you know, can be better controlled and don't have as great as impact on the agricultural economy. The region will grow by over 200,000 people and 85,000 jobs in the next 30 years. To manage growth, 60% of housing will regionally will be directed to developed areas. Despite this, there'll be a need for expansions to accommodate land in certain communities. And with all the expansions proposed through this plan, they would represent about 1% of the regional land base. West Lincoln has a 13% intensification rate proposed. It is based on the analysis uh, provided by GPS, who's done consulting firm that's done some work for the town. Uh, it's based on the potential for a little over 1,100 units within the existing urban boundary to come up with the intensification rate. And while the intensification rate it was determined from a ground up approach, and while it seems a little lower, it's 
partly in a sense it reflect it's a reflective of the small size of the West Lincoln built up area. In determining how we grow, we look at ident directing our growth to settlement areas. And as, as I mentioned, regionally we're identifying directing 60% of our growth to built up areas. And we identify strategic growth areas within the region where a significant amount of growth is to be provided because there's available infrastructure and transportation network. And these areas are like downtown St. Catharines, which is a provincial growth center. The ghost station areas of Grimsby, St. Catharines and Niagara Falls and future uh, area in Lincoln. Regional growth centers in downtown Welland, Niagara Falls and the South Niagara growth center around the future hospital in Niagara Falls. We also look at protecting employment areas for long-term and business investment and for job creation so that we have sufficient lands to accommodate that. And these are protected for the long-term. Uh, they're difficult to convert and they can only be converted through a municipal comprehensive review. And we've developed our uh, identification of employment areas in consultation with the local municipalities with a lot of involvement of the local planning departments. And the other key aspect of, of growth management is housing, right? You're creating a greater housing mix and targets for affordable housing. In terms of adjusting the urban boundaries, we had to consider land needs, develop criteria, and look at the timing as we moved along in the process. So from a land needs perspective, you can see what we're identifying from a regional perspective and community land need, employment area and rural areas. And, and with, the, with the proposed expansions, uh, it's important to note that we're also increasing the amount of greenbelt protected countryside area in the official plan, prime agricultural areas, and of course, identifying the provincial natural heritage system. In terms of criteria, over the last year, or more than the last year, the region has undertaken a significant amount of work to review settlement area boundaries. The work started with the creation of the Sabre assessment criteria to ensure a consistent approach to reviewing all proposed expansion locations. The region received a number of requests for expansion as well as the region identified land suitable for consideration. The result of this was 134 locations reviewed regionally. The assessment involved a multidisciplinary team of regional staff with expertise in the various areas of the criteria. It also included local planning staff for input and staff recommendations were advanced in December and then later in March to confirm to be part of the proposed official plan for formal public consultation. The urban assessment criteria were developed based on direction from the provincial policy statement, the growth plan and, and regional considerations. It's a comprehensive set of consideration, including impacts to agriculture and the environment ability to connect to servicing and roads and how it fits with the surrounding neighborhood among other factors. This is where we are in the settlement area boundary review process. As, as I mentioned, regional council uh, confirmed uh, some proposed recommended expansion areas for inclusion in the proposed official plan for formal consultation which we've just uh, finished some formal consultation in terms of an open house and public meeting. This slide identifies the proposed expansion areas um, in terms of community land, urban settlement land in yellow and employment area lands in blue. And this slide identifies the proposed hamlet expansion areas in West Lincoln that are part of uh, proposed as part of the official. Plan. 
And in terms of ways that we, tools that we help uh, that assist us in managing growth, we have district plans and secondary plans and district plans are, you may have heard of the Brock district plan and the Glendale district plan, setting a higher level vision and objectives for how those large areas can accommodate growth and develop long-term. And then we have secondary plans, which are blueprints for how a community can grow and develop and have strategic areas of intensification how infrastructure and transit can, or transportation networks and active transportation can all be considered together with open space needs, et cetera. And they're really a blueprint for how a community can grow. And we're requiring those for the large open greenfield lands as part of the expansion areas, as well as uh, we're requiring secondary plans or equivalency for um, our strategic growth areas that I mentioned. Urban design is another tool that's very important in, in helping the, you know, um, blending intensification uh, with uh, established neighborhoods and blending it and enhancing the public realm. All that has to be considered with infrastructure and transportation, as I mentioned. And also what's very important for our larger greenfield areas when, when we're developing our secondary plans, which is our blueprints for how the community can grow, is to have sub-watershed plans, which, which ensure the protection of our natural areas in there. And they, they look at the growth options that are being planned for those large areas and what the impact would be on the natural system. So these are our important outcomes for the official plan addressing affordable housing opportunities, policies to deal with climate change, efficient use of infrastructure, investments, protection of our natural and rural systems and support for economic development. This is our official plan timeline. We've just had some uh, formal consultation, as I mentioned, under the Planning Act. We held an open house uh, earlier in April and um, had about probably about 90 participants uh, for the open house in terms of listening to an update on the official plan and being able to ask questions. And we had a, a formal public meeting on April 28th under the Planning Act, and we had about 30 delegations providing comments. And we've also received comments that have been submitted in writing, of course, as well. So that con concludes the presentation. If you have any questions, I'm available to answer questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, at this point, I'll go to members around committee here um, to see if there's any comments or questions that they have uh, for their presenter. Not seeing. So, um, can we bring Kevin? Can we bring the screen up? Because I'm not seeing all councilors. Okay. Can you stop sharing for a minute, just so I can see the entire um, gallery yeah. here? Sure, yeah. Thank you. So again, any members of the committee have any questions or comments? I see Councillor Rayner. So I'll go to Councillor Rayner and yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, through to Mr. Sergi. Um, have you got any involvement in this process with the Indigenous people? Uh, through the chair to the Councillor, uh, yes, we have. We've had uh, numerous meetings, uh, first in person and then with the onset of COVID, of course, through Zoom, um, with the local uh, Indigenous communities, as well as First Nations that have treaty rights. Um, we started when we were in the development of background material, and we've had uh, participated and gotten their input and had discussions as we've moved along in the process with respect to draft policies and now the draft plan and the proposed plan. So we've tried to involve them uh, at a discussion and engagement level all along. Their areas of interest have often been on the natural environment, of course, archeology span and conservation. Yes, the reason I mention that is because as the chair read tonight, uh, the regional municipality of Niagara stands with all indigenous people past and present in promoting the wide stewardship of the lands on which we live 
and somehow I can't see these people thinking that this beautiful fields turning into a massive subdivision is what they really want to see happen to their land. I certainly, if I was in their position, don't mind us using it, but that's abusing it. And in a permanent way that cannot restore it back to its natural heritage, I would be ready to have World War III with the region over that one. Uh, you're saying that they're happy that uh, you can go ahead and take out beautiful agricultural land and throw massive subdivisions on their native land? Is that a question? Sorry. That's a question. Yes, because yeah. I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm baffled that they that they're the way you're speaking that they say, "Hey, no problem. Do whatever you want." I I, I didn't I find say that. Hard to believe. What what I through to the through the chair to the councillor. What I indicated was we've been consulting with them. Um, they their interest areas, which I identified, and and uh, they're well aware of what the plan is proposed. And they provided comments. Um, the comments, like I said, have been more along the lines of, of consultation, uh, mm -hmm. future consultation as well, and engagement in the natural environment, et cetera. Um, but uh, I, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't say that uh, their concerns are as you depicted them at all. And uh, we've been in consultation with them and their comments will all provided in a transparent manner for everyone to see. Okay, another question uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, you mentioned that the region is concerned about a viable agricultural community. Um, you put it in the singular. Um, we have 12 municipalities, therefore we have a lot of viable agricultural communities. Um, my question to you is, if you are concerned about viable agricultural communities, how come we're allowing the expansion on the hamlets and uh, taking out a lot of agricultural land for this projected growth to 2051, when in reality, uh, it's the opposite of promoting a viable agricultural community. It's actually trying to take away from that. And the other question I would have relating to that is the Ontario Minister of Agriculture, whose purpose in his portfolio is to protect the viability of agricultural land in Ontario. Has he objected to any of this? Because this is taking away what he was put into that position to protect. Uh, through the chair to the councillor, the approach we take, and as I mentioned at the beginning, is a, is a balanced approach. The region from a regional perspective overall is uh, using a higher intensification rate that's required by the province. Um, you know, we're requiring an intensification rate of 60% where the provincial requirement is 50%. Given that and given the amount of growth that's occurring and uh, the extent of our existing settlement areas, et cetera, there is a, a need for more land. Um, we obviously try, as I mentioned in the criteria, to limit the impact on the agricultural system and agricultural land base. Uh, there's very limited areas where expansion can occur that makes sense that's not on the agricultural land base to extent. extent. You, can't, you can't expand provincially into specialty crop areas, okay? But the province, why they prohibit expansion into specialty crop areas, don't explicitly prohibit expansion onto what would be prime agricultural lands by the province. But but that's not to say that you, you try and minimize that, which which is what we've done in, in taking the approach that we have. If we took the uh, approach of um, using the provincial intensification rate. Uh, for the built boundaries regionally, uh, the expansions would be greater than what we're proposing. And as, as in terms of looking at the locations for the expansions, the approach has been to assess uh, the impact on agriculture, assess uh, what the impact would be on the natural environment system, how the lands can be serviced, 
connections. I, I went through those criteria in the prison. Okay. okay, so hold on, Council, one second. We have our uh, Director of um, Environment wanting to chime in as well. So if you just give him a chance here. Director well, of Environment? That part, well, planning, building, environment, he does it all. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to add to what uh, uh, Mr. Hayworth is, is saying in response to Councillor Rayner, um, we've had, as you guys know, we've had extensive discussions around our council table about uh, how to deal with growth in the in the West Lincoln area and and we've chosen to concentrate growth in Smithville which is a much more efficient way to grow and develop on full services um, and and only I think it was four hamlets have a limited amount of expansion uh, plus then a rural employment park that we proposed in the Fulton area and, and the benefit or the advantage in my mind of doing it that way is that we then can hopefully avoid scattered non-farm development spread across the township. If we can concentrate non-farm growth in concentrated areas that are meant for the non-farmer and leave the farmer alone out in the agricultural areas to do his or her job to the best of their ability. That, that is my preference. That's the way I would prefer to, to do the planning. And I think that's consistent with what, uh, what Dave is saying uh, from across the region as well. The, the other thing, Councillor Rayner, just to add, I'm sorry, I just have to do it. Um, the, the Minister of Agriculture and Food for the uh, province of Ontario is a female by the name of Lisa Thompson. <laughs> um, I, I, oh, all right. Did I say male? I'm sorry. I, I meant minister. It didn't matter male or female to me. Whoever it was was not standing up and saying, hold on, you can't do that. You're taking away what I've been elected and put in this position to protect. This is against what I want to do. I got to get a hold of my my uncle Dougie and tell him I can't do this, and he's going to ask me. So that's that's kind of where I look at it. All right, Councillor, you said you had another follow up question. Yeah, just, no, I just got one other thing. You planned on bringing how many people to Niagara by twenty fifth? Another two hundred thousand. What was the number? Through the chair to the council, yes, about another two hundred thousand. Okay, I just wanted to put that in perspective. Having worked in Toronto for a number of years, gone through the hellish drive and everything associated with it, they do bring their driving habits to Niagara on the weekend. We're plugged solid from Burlington to Niagara Falls. You can't get around. If you increase that volume of people to Niagara, the people have come to Niagara because it's a break from the absolute rat race that's an hour away from us. If you bring that many people into Niagara, you are going to turn Niagara into Toronto and take away everything that the people here wanted, which was not busy, which was not crazy, which was common sense, nice day. I can go anywhere I want. I don't have to worry about mega traffic. You are going to transform this beautiful area of Ontario into an extension of Toronto. And I'm just saying I won't be around when that happens. I'm glad I won't be. But I can tell you the direction you're going in is against why so many of us went to Niagara because we love it the way it is. And that's all I've got to say on that. And down the road, I hope people would say, I remember Rainer said this a long time ago. Well, I'm sure you're going to see that. I'm sure what you on see on the weekend happens seven days a week. You're not going to like it. All right. Thank you, thank Councillor. You. I think for the record, I do think you're going to outlive us all. But I'm going to go back to our director who would like to ha add one more comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just... Um, to sort of tie things together between what uh, we have been working on here in West Lincoln and what Dave uh, Hayworth just uh, presented to us all. Uh, as the uh, committee knows, we have focused so far on the uh, appropriate way to uh, develop the Smithville area and, and had our own public meeting on April 27th. And then we've also proposed uh, boundary adjustments, as I mentioned earlier, for, for four of the hamlets plus the Fulton Rural Employment Park. In addition to that work, we will have to start in the very near future work to ensure that our official plan is also linked to the region's policy work uh, in, in a variety of different areas, including Councillor Rayner Agriculture, uh, as well as environmental policy, aggregate policy, water resource policy, and, and all of those other sort of non-urban or non-development type uh, policy sets, if I can call them that. So we have more work yet to do. And I believe, if I have this right, Dave, we have a year after your approval to get that done. So uh, we're about to embark on other work with respect to the official plan at the township level in the very near future. 
All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to go back to Councillor Rainer. Oh, so actually, hold on, Councillor Rainer. I promised Council. I forgot before. I was supposed to go to Councillor Ganan. So I'm going to go to Councillor Ganan first, and I'll come back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I have a question that sort of ties on to what Mr. Treble was just saying, but it is of you, Mr. Hayworth, please. Um, obviously, the timing of this has changed over the years as we've been moving towards the, the new regional plan and also our, our urban growth studies. So I'm wondering, as I'm sure many are, and that's why I'm asking this question, about whether the timing of this is going to be um, interrupted in any way, shape, or form by a provincial election. And with, with it just going in July um, to the province, I'm wondering what your sense is of how long it will take before that approval actually is given. I, and you know whether that. And when Mr. Treble talked about it being a year of, of studies and more things that need to be done as the work goes on, that made me question even more what thought you might have about the timing of how this will all play out. Mm, through the chair to the councillor. So our goal is to, uh, we had our public meeting April 28th. We want to get a recommended plan to council in June the, to submit to the province uh, before the beginning of July, which is the required due date, so to speak, to, to have the plan go to the province. Um, once it's at the province, it's in their hands in terms of their review and um, um, and analyzing the plan. There's also been changes at the province with respect to Bill 109, et cetera, and what the province will do in that regard in terms of how they'll review it uh, may change. There, you know, currently is no appeal to the provincial decision of the plan. Um, we have been in consultation with the province throughout the process in terms of discussing policies with them, et cetera, to, to assist uh, in, um, in their review and, and uh, limit modifications to the plan by the province when they get it, because uh, obviously our policies are required to conform to uh, the various provincial plans that are in place. So we've, we've done what we can in terms of trying to expedite the process and we'll continue to um, consult with the province through the process to try and expedite their review and approval of the plan. Um, once their plan is approval as, uh, approved, uh, then as Brian mentioned, uh, the local municipalities have a limited time to bring their plans into conformity. Um, we have always tried to assist in developing some policies that uh, originally were drafted but are going more into guidelines to help the local municipalities uh, know what kind of what we're looking at for conformity purposes. So to help the locals uh, with their conformity exercise, we're developing some guidelines to assist with that. Okay. I'll right, answer. All right, thank you. Um, I know I had Councillor Rayner that had a question, so I'll go to Councillor Rayner, and then in the meantime, if there's any other members that wanted to speak to this, this would be the time. I don't know if I missed Anne's. Okay, Mr. Mayor, you'll be next. Uh, I just wanted to add that uh, our Director of Planning does come from a farming background, so I am very comfortable in the fact that he understands the importance of agriculture, and he is with us in this township to look after the best interests of the agricultural community of which West Lincoln is the biggest in the 12 municipalities of the region of Niagara. And we need somebody that understands and respects the importance of agriculture. So I am very glad that he's there. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Very proactive. All right, I'll go to Mr. Mayor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And and um, and, and to uh, uh, Mr. Haywood, uh, appreciate the, uh, you know, again, the, uh, the presentation for, on behalf of the region. I think for the purposes of, of of perspective, though, I, 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 you gave us some pretty startling numbers, um, and some of them we can't control, and some of them we've mitigated. I think in a, in a quite a fabulous sort of way, and and um, I, I I I know exactly, um, uh, and I wasn't in the least bit surprised by Councillor Rayner's uh, you know concern that he continuously expresses for um, agriculture, uh, but the reality is. Um, uh, we're receiving uh, populations uh, from different levels of government, generally speaking from our federal government. So the federal government 
invites uh, and, and and through immigration and 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 uh, you know various other uh, geopolitical uh, means we receive. Uh, I think the current number is well over six hundred thousand people a year uh, into the country. It's about four hundred and forty, and I understand that uh, recently that's upped uh, quite substantially for the, the crisis in the Ukraine. That is a problem that, uh, well, or a problem that is a reality is probably the best way to say it. If Niagara in the next 30 years is going to receive 202,000, that represents a 40% increase in our current uh, population of just shy of uh, 500,000. And so just for perspective, to, to increase our population by a whopping 40%, but only increase the urban boundary for the next for that same period of time by uh, 1%. Uh, I think it is uh, a testament uh, to the hard work and uh, tight planning that's being done in, uh, in this endeavor. Uh, if you consider also, uh, at the same time, we've also mapped and secured natural heritage both uh, inside urban boundaries as well as provincially significant wetlands outside um, it's it's been truly a remarkable exercise of um, balancing as you say that's the word and i think it's an appropriate word in fact i think if anything that the balance is tipped towards uh, very 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 tight efficient planning so i i, I don't want to leave the public uh in the uh, with the um perspective that uh, this was very irresponsible planning and we're just uh, uh, contributing to urban sprawl. And I think that, you know, th th that's not anywhere close to the truth to increase your population by 40%, but only increase your urban boundary usage uh, by 1% is, I, I think, a testament to good planning. So that I I've repeated that now because I think that that's the, the key takeaway. And, and, and the, you know, this this plan is is you know has a lot of foresight to it. And we we discussed just prior to this how uh, most of us won't be here to see the complete fruition of this plan. Uh, that's how far we're planning ahead, and then I think that that's um, you know expresses the vision for what, where we want to go. This this is leaving. This is thirty years. This is leaving a wise stewardly plan for um, our children. And uh, we hope that they take the mantle and continue wise planning uh, uh, beyond that uh, into the next generation. But that's the one that, that, that when that 30 years comes up, that we hope that that generation appreciates uh, the diligent work uh, that's uh, been done, handed to them. And the, the last thing I just want to make is a comment um, with respect to um, solving um, the the equal and uh, you know uh, correlating challenge of home prices and and home affordability. Um, Council Rayner would acknowledge that, um, and and all the councillors would acknowledge that home prices have gone um, insanely um, uh, in in many regards out of control, and the re the, you know they're subject to the simple basic economic principle of supply and demand. And the province is under great pressure because of the numbers that are they're receiving from the federal government uh, to increase the supply, increase the supply. So we're doing so in a, that is the challenge. That is the challenge. And that means we have to give away something. And so um, I often find uh, that uh, people inside of homes, uh, people who have homes in this environment, are looking on the one hand at their bottom line of the value of their home and saying, you know, kind of, you know, uh, rubbing their hands in glee and say, hey, you know, we're, we're building a nest egg and that's, and that's well and good. And, and that's part of the equation. But at the same time, for those of us who have um, uh, young adults uh, emerging into this market, uh, we're, we're not rubbing our hands, we're rubbing our hair, you know, rubbing our heads, trying to uh, wonder how our uh, young adults are going to come into this market. And I think uh, that's the equal and opposite um, challenge. And we have to find the balance between those two. So those are my comments, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Yep, thank you. I see Councillor Yonker. Yeah, 
through you, Mr. Chair, to uh, Mr. Hayworth there. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It's always interesting and a challenge to see growth coming down the line. It's, uh, well, yeah, it is uh, what we need for a good economy as well. So there's a good balance and I, I'm, I'm glad to see that we're, we're taking this uh, very seriously and considering all the things that, that, that does, that this will affect. Um, just a quick question to uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to uh, Mr. Hayworth on slide 16. Um, you mentioned that we are adding um, green belt and prime plan pre uh, agriculture area as well as 38,000 hectares of provincial natural heritage systems. Um, and just on that natural heritage system, does, if we're adding th that as into a uh, natural heritage system, does that mean it cannot be farmed? Uh, it's just kind of one of the things I was kind of wondering there. If you could explain. Uh, through the chair to the councillor, that's a good question. So the provincial natural heritage system um, that we are incorporating into the regional plan um, is being applied right now, um, even though it's not in the regional plan because of provincial policy. So. While it's not in the plan right now, it's it's being applied because we have to apply it. Okay, so I wanna wanna bring that to your attention, but obviously we're gonna reflect that in the plan. Uh, the system is kind of widespread and, and obviously it incorporates natural features, but it does kind of go across agricultural lands because they do provide connection for wildlife and and, and that type of thing. Um, but there are more specific policies that in the agricultural areas that are part of the system um, where uh, that are outside of like the features themselves, like the woodlots and different things like that, um, that agricultural activities obviously can occur as, as they do occur. Thank you. All right. Is that all your questioning, Councillor Yonker? Yeah, oh, thanks. No yep. problem. All right, so at this point, I think uh, I, we've heard from everybody. So uh, thank you very much for your presentation there. And uh, we're going to move forward uh, with the rest of our agenda. So have yourself a good night there, sir. So moving thank, forward. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Oh, no problem. Moving forward. So I originally, um, I see now that Karen Alexander's in the, um, the gallery here. So this time we'll take a step back to item P4422, Invasive Species Center, the European Water Chestnut in the Welland River. So hi, Karen, um, hi. welcome. And uh, the floor is yours. Uh, you can make your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I apologize for uh, missing my 6.30 start. Thanks for having me present tonight. Um, as said, my name is Karen Alexander. I'm with the Invasive Species Center. And hopefully you can share, see my screen now. How does that look? Looks good to okay. us. Okay, thank you. Well, thanks again for having me. Um, I've had some correspondence with Jarrett uh, about this project. So some of your staff are aware of what's going on. The Invasive Species Center is here tonight to, to tell you about this um, issue in the Welling River and what we're doing to uh, address it. So I first want to just acknowledge that we are living and working in the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people. Um, the Invasive Species Center, the building is located in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. We have staff that, that do sit across Ontario. Uh, I'm down in Amherstburg, um, just as an FYI. So we are a not-for-profit organization that we do work to connect stakeholders, technology and knowledge to essentially prevent the introduction and harm of invasive species that harm Canada's economy, the environment and society. And that last piece is really important. There's a lot of non-native and invasive Karen. Species. Yeah. yeah. If you just, it seems, the sound seems, so we're having a little bit of audio issues and I think it's when you turn your head to your right and stare at the camera. So I think you have a microphone okay. to your left. If you could just speak there, we just hear it a little bit better. Sorry to interrupt you. No, I appreciate you telling me that. How does that sound? That sounds great so far. Okay, I might just look a little awkward because I'm going to lean into my laptop here. Um, <laughs> I need a new headset. So the last part is very important because we focus on the species that actually have the potential to harm our economy, a society and environment. 
And I was saying there's lots of non-native invasive species in Canada. So we, we tend to focus on the ones that are really bad. Um, so tonight I'd like to just, well, I've done the introduction to ISC and I'd like to talk about the rapid response program that we're putting together to uh, address this uh, emerging problem in the Welland River. The European water chestnut uh, in Latin Trappus natan is from Europe and Asia and it is a floating aquatic plant that will create these really dense mats in the um, still waters of river systems, lake systems, ponds. It really likes the calm, quiet water like the Welland River. Um, it is really harmful. It, it decreases property values. It'll impact commercial fishing uh, and species at risk fish in the river or nearby and other tributaries. Um, there's also aquatic species at risk mussels in the Welland River that we believe this species could potentially do a lot of harm to. Um, and we know the mussels are already under uh, extreme stress after the introduction of zebra mussels and quagga mussels in the Great Lakes. The real big kicker though that uh, municipalities um, tend to not like to hear is when this thing um, establishes a waterfront, it's impossible to wade through impossible it's very difficult to paddle through and these seeds drop from the plant and cover the bottom and they're really sharp they cut through feet they cut through water shoes and it's just really bad for recreation and then of course there's a number of ecological impacts that most invasive species cause it all is also a prohibited species in ontario um, the invasive species act was written in 2015 and they've added 13 species this January 1st, uh, water chestnut was added and it, it's meant to support um, the, the in, support the reduction of spread and provide some legislation to reduce the likelihood that this plant will spread in Ontario. It also gives us a bit more um, uh, clout, I guess, to go after when it does arrive. And it is coming, uh, but it's not quite established in Ontario. This is a map from the Early Detection and Distribution Mapping System. You can see uh, chestnut's a real big problem in New England, of the, in the New England area of the U.S. It's uh, up in the millions of dollars being spent to try to control this species and the impacts it's having. It's just arriving in Ontario um, with a few... Uh, populations established in Eastern Ontario that are currently being managed by Ducks Unlimited and Voyager Provincial Park. And this um, next map shows four red points, which were locations submitted to the EdMap system from a DFO biologist that was off duty and just recreationally paddling down your river. She noticed the infestation and submitted it to EdMap. We got a hold of it and Ducks Unlimited and ISC went out last summer and paddled this stretch of the river to get a better idea of what we were dealing with. And this is the extent of the infestation. Um, the worst of it's in the green line area, so kind of in between, but mostly around the purple dots. The yellow dots are floater plants, so European water chestnut breaks off rosettes and they float down the river, start little new populations. So we removed all the floating plants and we knew we'd have to come back to deal with that larger stretch um, of the river. So we set out to start some fundraising. We, all, oh, sorry, we also put these signs up. I don't know if anyone has seen them. Thank you very much to the town of West Lincoln. We put one up at your community center. So these are there just to let the community know a little bit about this problem. Um, so we have... I think I forgot my fundraising slide, but I'll just explain it to you. We have applied to two grants, the uh, DFO's Species at Risk uh, Habitat Stewardship Fund and the Ministry of Environment's uh, Great Lakes Aquatic Action or Great Lakes Community Action Fund. We've yet to hear from either of them, but the NDMNRF has a emergency reserve fund that they have authorized us to use to go after this population. So we do have some seed funding. We have enough to get something going this year. Um, so controlling this 
species, um, the, the methods that are working in Ontario are a mix of hand pulling the plants when the population is less than 100 meters squared. And you do that from canoes, kayaks, and small boats. And you're aiming to pull the plant out before it matures and drops seeds. This is an annual plant. So if you stop the seed production, you remove the population. Anything greater than 100 meters squared is uh, the Voyager Provincial Parks recommending heavier equipment, uh, like um, amphibious machines that go in and cut it out, or herbicide. But we did, they did document a 95% reduction in seed viability within four years, and follow-up monitoring recommended for up to 10 so we're proposing um, a EDRR program, Early Detection Rapid Response. Um, we have done some work to engage some of the local partners. Um, NPCA is on board and supportive. We have the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters providing funding for four technicians, uh, partial funding. We have interest from Peninsula Paddlers Club, Burt Miller Nature Club, and Niagara College. Um, <laughs> NPCA has also received interest from Scouts Canada. So what we'd like to do is hire four students, for our field technicians we're calling them. They're going to start at the end of June, be ready to go on the river in July. The NPCA is offering their Chippewa Conservation Area property as a home base. And we are looking at potential uh, bringing in a heavy, a heavy equipment contractor. Um, at this point, we, we don't have the funds for that, but it is something we're going to keep looking to fund. Um, and then we'll have a community engagement piece, which is uh, where Jarrett has been really helpful um, with uh, contacting, well, we're planning to contact riverfront landowners to let them know what we're doing out there in the river. And then the NPCA is working with us to host uh, paddling tours. So we want to teach people about what it is this plant is and what, how to report it. We uh, intend to continue to invest in this program as required for the next 10 years, and if not longer. And we are in, really excited to do the training and, and help the community become more aware of this threat. Uh, we also have a potential partnership with Niagara College for um, paddling trips in the September month. So this is the... Um, ask of the town of West Lincoln. Um, we are hoping that you will send some staff to join the Well and River Collaborative. We're looking at a once a year meeting to kind of get everyone informed and understand what's going on and how we're gonna control the population in that year. Um, river access, your boat launch at the community center is a, is a fabulous facility and we're hoping we can use that boat launch um, as needed through uh, the program. We'll be launching a canoe and a small boat. Um, the biomass disposal, I guess I, I glanced over that part. Um, you have to remove the plant entirely from the river and pile it away from the river. Once you do that, it decomposes really fast. It, it dies when it's not in the water. We have um, an agreement or an offer from the NPCA to put the plant in a plantation on the AC Brown uh, conservation area. Now, if there is a need or if we, we say, find we are spending too much time running up and down the river, we're wondering if that, that community center is a, is a spot that we could put vegetation to, to decompose. That's not an, a necessary Thing, but it was something we thought about because you're kind of smack in the middle of the river. Um, the public relations piece, we were we would just kindly share some information and then ask you to share it out. And uh, again, the dish, the uh, mail out to riverfront landowners would be really helpful. Um, it's, it's a lot uh, easier to just have the township send something out to specific addresses if, if you're willing to do that. Uh, and then this is the heavy equipment that works for Phragmites that we thought could work for European water chestnut. And that's funding dependent. But what would happen is they'd bring this barge in. They would use these truck stores down here in the, in the image. And they cut the biomass out, load up the barge, run it to shore. And then the town uh, up in Oliphant, the, the town of South Bruce Peninsula has a small bobcat on the shoreline. And they just lift the biomass up, truck it away. And that's what's working up there. So I wanted to put this slide on to just 
I mean, we're in this for, you know, the next four to 10 years. So if, if we're finding that the hand pulling is, is a struggle, we may need to, to move to larger equipment. So that's, that's what that might look like. Um, I know that was a lot. Um, I, I might just skip this slide, but it was a, um, just an opportunity to introduce prevention. Um, this program is really about prevention and containment. We don't want this thing in Ontario. And we're, we're really pleased to have that authorization from NDMNRF to, to spend some money and, and actually respond to the EDMAP report that came in about a highly aggressive uh, plant that's arrived in Ontario. So before it can establish, we're, we're, we're gonna try <laughs> to get it out of the river. Um, and these are some other ways to, to work on prevention methods that the, the committee or the town might, might be interested in looking into. Some of the other ones that are coming, spotted lanternfly is a big one, and I could give you some information on that if you're interested. Uh, this one has decimated wineries in Pennsylvania, and it's on its way to Ontario. Um, as far as I know, wineries across the province are on quite high alert, and they're well aware of it, but it might be something you, you read up on if you have an interest. Um, municipal community of practice is another way that the township might find a really great opportunity to engage with ISC and other municipal staff on invasive species discussions. So if you're interested in that, please do contact me and I'll get you in touch with the, uh, my colleague who runs that community of practice. And I'll stop there and take any questions um, or go back to any slides. Thanks very much for having me. Thanks, Karen. Um, I see your hand there, Mr. Mayor. For once, for just one second there, uh, I'm going to go to our CAO uh, because on the agenda here we have just the presentation, but there uh, within the presentation there's a little bit of an ask, and I don't think it's an unreasonable ask, but I would just like to know uh, before we kind of get into any kind of conversation or potential debate, I'd like you to weigh in if we should be referring this back to staff to come back to committee at another time. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the question. And uh, hi, Karen. Um, interesting, um, interesting presentation about that invasive species, which I didn't really know anything about. So um, this is obviously something that would be of great interest to us. And, and coincidentally, our senior management team is meeting with the NPCA leaders on um, Wednesday morning. So I'm going to be adding this to that agenda just to talk about what we can do together and roles and responsibilities. So um, I know that this is this isn't going to be your first um, the first year of it, but you you do. It sounds as though you want to, we've or we've already put the signs up. You want some assistance with the distribution, and I, I haven't chatted with staff about that yet, but we could do that. Um, using the boat launch is a public boat launch, so please use it. And um, um, and then just putting it on the community, like uh, I'd have that, that's a, certainly a question I'd have to talk with the NPCA about. So the, yeah, this is a, this is a, an interesting issue. And I think I, I like the idea of getting on top of it mm -hmm. rather than, I mean, I've dealt with milk oil for years and years and years in other parts of Ontario and we, and we just, you have to get on it. So, so Madam CEO, would you, at some point, do you need a direction from staff, uh, from council yeah, here? Yeah. Okay. It's good to have direction. Okay. okay. So, put effort towards this. I'll park that for a moment. I'll go to Mr. Mayor. I don't know if he has any questions or comments. Yeah. So, um, thank you for the informative presentation. Um, you know, uh, we certainly, I, I think, in our community, would certainly understand the uh, need to get ahead of an invasive species. We're struggling with our uh, currently with our um, emerald ash borer, and and uh, we do have a, a gypsy moth uh, infestation and. And, um, uh, you know, the, these things, you know, uh, I, my kids can identify uh, Phragmites wherever they can on our <laughs> property. So we kind of maintain that, uh, you know, that, that those populations on, on, on our property. Um, I, you know, I, I think that um, if we decide to go ahead, and I'd be more than willing to put forward uh, a motion stating that staff uh, look into uh, providing recommendations to council at a later date. Um, that uh, we we alert, um, you know, uh, in in addition to um, uh, like there's the other naturalist clubs and there's the other uh, like and and um, uh, the woodlot association and all those those, those types of clubs because uh, you know even if you have a woodlot and it's confined to quote unquote land, um, you know I I I think that uh, you know a woodlot. 
owner does tend to look beyond just their woodlot and the trees. And so sometimes they look in the water and I do, I find myself looking in the water that passes by my house. And, and, um, and so just getting that heightened sense of, of awareness up, um, I think is a good thing. So, um, when the time comes, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I don't know, maybe we'll do that under uh, other business. I'll draft up a quick uh, motion to have staff uh, 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 come back with recommendations. And and uh, the comment was made in, uh, um, uh, that uh, perhaps this is something we can also bring forward at AMO um, at, uh, as a delegation to um, you know get ahead of this is if this is just coming on the radar for um, Ontario, uh, uh, you know, just kind of looking at the size of the red, then uh, I, I think that would be appropriate to uh, to pr look into as well. So, thank okay. you, uh, Mr. Chair. No problem, and I agree definitely with the delegation at AMO if we can get ahead of this. And I think if anything, Mr. Mayor, I'll ask you to bring that as a new item of business. Um, yeah. Okay. At, uh, at the time, we'll draw something comes. now. Yeah. Okay. And I'll go to Councillor Rayner. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through to Karen, thank you for your presentation. I found that interesting, but I also find, find it very puzzling. Uh, the Welland River, um, yes, it's, a, it's large, but I mean, I don't think it's near the size of the Grand River or anything, uh, mm -hmm. but the Grand River flows very strongly. I know the Welland River comes by my area and it doesn't necessarily grow very strong unless we have a lot of rain. Uh, how did this species get here in the first place and what is the significance that would have drawn whatever it was to put it in a river that to me doesn't serve a lot of purpose. I, I, I'm so, just a little confused on how it would get into a, a river like the Welland River. So, so Councillor, part of that slide, if I understood correctly, had suggested that it could have came through the feathers of a bird and, and the seeds could have dropped through um, the, um, I guess, the transportation of animals. Uh, and so again, I, I, Karen, you're more than welcome to answer it more in depth there, but I think that's, if I remember correctly, there was mention about how it got transferred around was through birds. That's what, that's the main uh, consensus on how it's making long distance jumps, which is another reason why it's really important to get on this one because wildlife moves around. So the sooner you can get rid of the biomass and remove it from the river, the less likely somebody's gonna pick it up and take it to another river like the Grand or um, what's that? Lyles Creek, I understand, is a, is a significant tributary in your region um, that has species that risk fish. So there's, you know, a real good um, interest in trying to stop this, this uh, plant. Um, okay, let's trace it back. Then you're saying it's by birds, but the birds had to get it from somewhere. Has there oh. been a particular area that's been isolated 15 years ago, 20 years ago? That was the hot spot. That was the start of all this. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure I could pinpoint it to the exact spot. I can tell you it arrived in New England. Um, I'm sure they have that written somewhere. I think, it's, I think it's either New York or Maine or New Hampshire or one of the, one of the eastern states that likely it arrived there and it's been spreading um and it well how did it get here i believe it was recre it was um I don't, i'm sorry i don't want to misspeak but i know i've read this <laughs> so i'd like to perhaps get back to you on that if you don't mind that's if perfect. you're interested that's perfectly fine counselor do you have another question i have another counselor no that's fine thanks very much okay thank you counselor yonker did I see your hand up? Yeah, sorry. Missing? Well, okay. I was just looking at the map there, going. I, I think if anything, it came out of Massachusetts, Boston, um, Springfield. There, there's a lot of numbers there. So, Mass Massachusetts seems to be the culprit. But um, yeah, birds fly pretty quick, right? So it doesn't take much. And so, yeah, it would be interesting to see how the rest of uh, Ontario can help us with this, right? So, just thanks uh, that you're organizations on top of this and doing the work that they do we definitely appreciate it and um definitely would be pretty easy like if you look at the one picture i guess the question i'm going to ask you is um it looks like you're trying to show on the one picture there that you can almost pull it out with a the kayak paddle is that correct and then um so it's not that hard to uh get on top of it if everybody does their part right Correct. Um, the hand pulling is a technique that's working in the smaller populations of the species. Um, it's when it gets into these larger patches that it's hard to, to manually remove it. But 
the idea of hand pulling is to get the plant and the whole plant all the way down to the seed in the in the substrate. Uh, and if you miss that, it can regrow from if if say the stem snaps and you only get top of the plant, it'll regrow from there. So in some cases you do need to repull, uh, which is why we have the hired staff and they'll be going up and down the river and and trying to make sure the plant does not get to seed. That's the purpose. Um, stop it from dropping seed and, and in four years we'll see a, a reduction. Okay, thank you. Any other members of committee here? Not seeing or hearing anything. So Karen, I believe that's all uh, we require from you at this point. You're welcome to stay at some point by the end of the meeting. It looks like we might have a motion come forward. So if you'd like to see how that turns out, um, please hang in there. Uh, in the meantime, just uh, mute yourself and turn off your, uh, your camera there. Okay, thanks again and have a good rest of the meeting. Thank you, you too. All right, so we're gonna move forward uh, to request to address items on the agenda. So. Sorry, Mr. Chair, if I could interrupt, my apologies. Um, because this is uh, an appointment, we can actually bring forward a recommendation now instead of under new item, our new business item. Okay, that's that good That would be to know. fine if you brought it forward. Right All now. right, so we'll just rewind a second there and I'll go to Mayor Bilsma. Okay, so I was just banging one, I was just banging one out on my um, phone to text to uh, Deputy Clerk uh, Dyson. Uh, so I'll just re read it at this point, and then as soon as I'm done reading it, I'll text it to her, and and any uh, things can be uh, made to it. So this is what I have: um, that staff be directed to gain information and make a rec and make recommendations on the invasive species European water chestnut in the Welland River, and report back to the Summer Planning Committee meeting. And that two uh, that a delegation request to uh, AMO be submitted to an appropriate ministry. And I was going to say three that um, this um, uh, this be um, how you say reported to various stakeholders in the Niagara region, including the NPCA, uh, Niagara Landowners Association, and um, uh, uh, so you're that's looking, where I started to fall off. Yeah, yeah so, so you're looking at like that. CC the other, I guess, players. Yeah, and, and maybe we can include the province or AMO in that somewhere. So basically, I had you know that that we would be here back at the July, and, and again, I I I'd take any staff direct, um, directive, but so that we would actually get a little bit of information, so that we could um, go to AMO in August. So that AMO is part of it. It's number two and number three would be uh, that very circulate it. Yeah, be circulated. There you go. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So okay. that's I'm going to just text that. That's on the floor if, if somebody would be so uh, kind as to second that. Okay. So I have Council Yonker as a seconder, but before I go anywhere else, I'm going to go to our CAO who has her hand up. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to ask, and I don't know, Karen, I, you could still answer this, it, just in terms of the issue of getting it out to all the stakeholders. Are you meeting with other groups within Niagara Region? Because I don't want to duplicate it, but I also want to support Thank you. Good question. Um, what I'm planning to do or what we're planning to do is host a collaborative meeting at the end of June. So once the um, technicians are brought on, we thought it would be nice to have them at that meeting and see some of the partners. Um, and at that point, we'll have a schedule of paddling tours available when we're planning to take interested parties down the river to teach them what this thing looks like. And um, we would likely have, um, well, we will have some communication materials available for the collaborative members to use um, at their leisure, whether put it on their website, social media, um, et cetera. And then specifically for the town of West Lincoln, we would have a draft letter and content that we would love for you to forward to the landowners along the river. Um, something to kind of get ahead of all the phone calls, right? Like who, who's on the river pulling plants? <laughs> Yeah, so we, yeah. We, we thought it would be good to just send something out in the mail uh, from the township. Oh, so uh, thank you for that. And I think that I that was not what I was expecting, but that's good information. I think um, well, then going back to the mayor's um, motion, well, we can do um, the appropriate ministry of the province, um, the region, and PCA, and then the municipalities that are on the river. That'd be perfect. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I'll just remind you that NDMNRF is, is is putting the funds up to go after this thing right now. So they're okay. well aware of the project. Yeah, so good. 
Mm-hmm. So maybe maybe we'll just tell them that to keep going with that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I have Councilor Ganan who has a question as well. So I'm going to let Councilor Ganan have a chance here. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So Karen, I just have a quick question regarding um, getting information out to the people who live out that way. And are you, by the end of June, planning to have some kind of a public brochure? I'm thinking we have a public library right on the property that would be a really good place for people who live in the, the Wellamport River area. You know, that, that whole stretch are in and out regularly in the library. I just wondered if that might prove to be an extra resource in terms of getting information out. That's a great idea. Yeah, we can do that. Something with photos Um, or this is what we're looking for or, you know, something along that line. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, we've also been talking about maybe doing an open house type event. Um, And then maybe the community center would be a nice spot to rent um, to do that. And and then just be available for those kinds of questions. Um, We just weren't sure how much traction we'd get in year one. <laughs> yeah. Well, just know that that's a resource available, that, you know, both the community center and the library are there, and they're, they're excellent ways to get information out to the public, so, especially the public who, who live directly, you know, connected to that waterway, so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, no problem. And so, I'm, I'm going to go to our deputy clerk to read us some kind of uh, resolution here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just give me one moment. I was just finishing up the last point. Okay, while you finish that up, I see um, Councillor Rayner. Um, did, did I see your hand up there, Councillor Rayner? Or? Okay. No, I'm just waiting. Okay, just making sure. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, to Mr. Mayor. Um, were we doing the delegation request to AMO still? Did you still want that in the recommendation? Um, I, I, think, I think we could. As a as a suggestion at this point, and then we'll let staff, um, you know, obviously Madam CAO is the one that submits those and, and we'll let, obviously we, we can't demand a delegation. So, you know, we can put something together and um, if it's accepted, then we'll have a, um, an item to talk about. Uh, it has been part of our discussions um, ongoing between uh, uh, Madam CAO and myself. So yeah, I'd like to include it as just uh, as a highlight, and then of course the request goes in, and we'll see w- w- the chips fall where they may. So that's a yes, Jessica. <laughs> yeah, that's a political yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that the correspondence received from Karen Alexander regarding European water chestnut in the Welland River, dated May 9, 2022, be received. And that staff be directed to gain information, information and make a recommendation to the invasive species European water chestnut in the water in the Welland River and report back to the summer planning building environmental committee meeting. And that a delegation request to AMO be submitted at an appropriate to an appropriate ministry and that this recommendation be circulated to various stakeholders, including the NPCA, AMO, Region of Niagara and municipality, municipalities within the surrounding the Welland River. That sounds good to me. I see a thumbs up from the mover. I love it. Thank you. And I, I'm going to just confirm. I don't see the being problem. Okay. Thumb up from the seconder. Um, at this point, if there's any other questions or comments, this is a time. If not, I'm going to call the question. Not seeing or hearing any, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? All right, that carries unanimously. All right, so thank you, Karen. I'm glad we were able to resolve that for you while you're still here, and uh, you enjoy the rest of your evening there. Thank you, everyone. All right, so we're going to move forward to address items on the agenda. Um, I'm going to go to IT, if we can just bring up the virtual gallery here to see if there's any members that would like to address any items on the agenda. Uh, not, not seeing any, I'll give them a second. If you need to raise your hand, you can. All right, so not seeing that, we'll go forward to consent agenda items. And uh, all items listed below are considered to be routine and non-controversial and can be ap- approved by one resolution. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member requests it in which case the item will be removed from the consent resolution and considered immediately following the adoption of the remaining consent agenda items. And the recommendation is that the Planning, Building, Environmental Committee 
Hereby approve the following consent agenda items. Items 1 and 2 B and are hereby received for information um, with the exceptions of, and there's currently none, and then I'm going to read what the items 1 and 2 actually are for those at home just listening in. So item 1 is um, multi-municipal wind turbine working group minutes, February 10th, 2022, and 2 information report PD 51 2022 proposed amendment to the Greenbelt area boundary regulation growing the size of the Greenbelt. So at this point I'm going to get a mover. And seconder, so I have Councillor Ganan and Councillor Braderick as my mover and seconder. Is there any items that anybody wishes to withdraw? Not seeing or hearing any, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? And oppose? I'm going to, Councillor, was that, Yonker, was that in favor or opposed? There might be a delay here. Okay, he's froze. Okay, I'm going to assume that was supported. Okay, excellent. Thank you for the thumbs up. All right, so that carries. We're going to move forward to communications. Um... Item P4722, Julie Hamilton, Deputy Clerk, Municipality of Aaron Edelsley, Eldersley, uh, municipal, um, multi-municipal wind turbine working group, setback recommendations from wind turbines. And the recommendation is that the correspondence received from Julie Hamilton, the Deputy Clerk, regarding the multi-municipal wind turbine working group, setback recommendations from wind turbines, dated April 22nd, 22, be received. Um, pardon me? For information. For information. And uh, that's all I, I have here, right? Okay. So at this point, I need a mover. Councilor Braderick is seconder. Uh, Councilor Ganan. Um, at this point, any questions or comments? Not seeing or hearing any. You're going to call the vote. All those in favor for receiving it for information. And that carries. So we're going to move forward to uh, Stat Report PD4822. Make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself here. Director of Planning and Building Brian Treble, and it's a recommendation report PD5320. 2 stamp pack request to waive minor variance fee and building permit fee. And the recommendation is that report PD 5322 regarding recommendation report stamp pack request to waive the minor variance fee and building fee permit or permit fee. Uh, Data May 9th, 2022 be received. And that the township staff work with the committee of adjustment to process a minor variance application in a timely fashion as 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 Sorry, let me do that again. In as timely a fashion as possible in order to allow a building permit fee to be issued and that the authority to waive the fees apply prior to ratification of this report by town council. And that's it. So at this point, I need a mover and seconder. I got Councillor Ganan, um, Councillor Trombetta as a seconder. Uh, questions and comments? Not seeing or hearing any. All I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? And opposed? All right, that carries. So we're going to move forward to the next item. Uh, item uh, P4922, Madison Etzel, and Director of Planning and Building, Brian Treble, and Recommendation Report PD49-2022. It's a zoning bylaw amendment, Neil Carter, 2990 South Grimsby Road 18, file number 1601-0022. And it's a recommendation, or here's a recommendation that that report, PD49-2022, regarding recommendation report, zoning bylaw amendment, Neil Carter, 2990 South Grimsby Road 18, file number 1601-0022, dated May 9th, 2022, be received. And that the application for zoning bylaw amendment 1601-0022 submitted by Neil Carter and a corresponding zoning bylaw be approved and passed. And that staff be authorized to circulate the notice of decision for the zoning bylaw amendment and the corresponding 20-day appeal period. So if I can get a mover for that one. Council, or Mayor Bilsma and Councillor Trombetta is a seconder. Any questions or comments? Not seeing or hearing any, I'll call the question. All those in favor? And that carries. So we'll move forward to item 5022, recommendation report PD 502022, and it is Bill 109, more homes for every plan, or for everyone plan. And it's a, the recommendations that planning report PD 502022 regarding information report Bill 109, more homes for everyone plan, dated May 9th, 2022, be received for information purposes, and that the township. 
uh, hereby notify the Region of Niagara of their support for the Region's letter regarding response to More Homes for Everyone Act 2022, Provincial Bill 109, dated April 29, 2022, as found at Attachment 1 in, uh, to this report. So if I can get a move, I got Councillor Braderick, I need a seconder. I got Councillor Ganan. Any questions or comments? I got Councillor Ganan. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I realize that, that this is a, a report only, and I also realize that it's had royal assent, but um, in going through, I, I had a few questions, and, and I don't know if anybody has an answer, but I certainly want these comments on the record. Um, I have major concerns about the changes, in particular, to the building code um, regarding this issue. I have a, a really strong concern about looking at um, 12 stories, of mass timber buildings um, based on the number of fires that we've had in this last little while um, both in Ontario but in particularly um, th there have been a, a huge huge number of fires in New England and that's because most of those buildings are made of wood uh, no matter the height they have not ha had the restrictions and that becomes a major issue so so I'm concerned about that and I'm concerned about the single egress that they say that they're studying in a four to six six story residential areas so I guess my question question is, I, I read a lot of other background articles on this, and I've read through the bill, but I've not really seen any comments from the fire marshal's office or comments from any fire departments regarding the issue of safety, looking at, at these two things that are changing the building code. The building code has kind of been the Bible, um, you know, thou shalt do, thou shalt not do, and, and I appreciated that strictness, and I think that it's kept most of us safe. So um, I, I think I just want to know when a group of uh, essentially, you know, bankers and builders and, and developers uh, have so much input into this, I, I'm just wondering if the balance was ever there or whether you, Mr. Treble, know or whether Madam CAO knows or, Mr., you know, maybe the mayor knows whether there are any what, was ever any input regarding the safety issues from uh, mostly fire perspective in terms of looking at some of these changes. So I see we have our Madam CEO with her hand up, so I'll go to her first. Um, thank you, and um, I, I don't know specifically, I, I know that our, our director will have more information on this, but I do know that there wasn't very much consultation on this at all. So I'm not too, sh I can't um, say whether or not the fire marshal's office um, or our, even our own fire services commented on it. So I think it's something that is worthy of us raising as time goes on. And then I see our, our yeah, our director can speak to this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, I can't add a whole lot more than what Bev has added, except to say that, that the, the consultation period for providing comments went until April the 29th, but the bill received royal assent on April the 14th, which is unheard of as far as I know, that, that you're, you're still receiving comments long after you've already made a decision to push forward with a, with a piece of legislation. So I would anticipate that there were lots of comments received that were simply not given any consideration as part of the approval of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see Councillor Rayner. Thank you. Further to uh, Mr. Treble's comment, then this whole thing appears to be a setup, a joke, uh, a disregard of the democratic process. And for us to support this is basically supporting a procedure that's going on right now that is basically against the democratic process to which they've been elected. So I think we better think carefully when we're voting on this. Are we supporting what they're saying here? Are we supporting the way they did it? So I believe we're supporting the letter that's. Uh, um, that the region um, has sent forward. I believe you know, the region addressed their concerns and, and made their points, uh, and so I don't think we have to worry as much, but I'll, let, uh, I'll go to our director first to see if he wants to provide a little context there. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. We are identifying some concerns that we have with the bill. Um, we, we didn't focus on the, uh, the fire-related ones as, as strongly as, as Councillor Ganan has spoken to them, but... Uh, we certainly have concerns with the Planning Act pieces, for example, as, as uh, has been noted in the report. Um, there's now timelines in place and we have to return or refund monies to the, uh, to the developers in the event that we don't achieve the timelines. And even in West Lincoln, where we're relatively efficient, 
um, we don't achieve the timeline 75% of the time based on the four examples that we, we presented to you. So we'll be returning money and most of the planning process will end up on the backs of the taxpayers as a result of, of that circumstance, which really doesn't make any sense. The user should pay. And uh, for us, the complication is that the process in a lot of instances is out of our control. We receive an application, we start a process, we realize that there's incomplete pieces to it, we send it back to the developer, but now the clock keeps ticking and we're being penalized when it's in the hands of the developer uh, to provide comments back to us. So there's, there's flaws in that piece of the process that we've, we've focused on and uh, also expressed some concerns via the region with respect to some of the other legislation that's been amended as well. Is that it, Councillor? Um, yeah. Well, again, yeah. it's, again, it's just it's just my comment, Mr. Chair, uh, supporting Mr. Treble that the purpose of of the comments was to get all these things heard before they pass it, and since it's already passed, it circumvented the whole democratic process, yeah. and has put us into an awkward situation right now and cost the taxpayers money. So I can't possibly see, regardless of how the chair thinks it should be looked at. Uh, this whole thing was not done according to the process to which we and they were elected to do. Yeah, and, and just to clarify, like the vote tonight is not supporting Bill 109. As far as I'm concerned, this was a knee-jerk decision that the province made. But at, at, but at the point, we're addressing concerns that are being brought forward through this that we're hoping will be um, rectified or at least addressed in some capacity. So supporting this tonight is supporting the letter that we brought forward to the region, or the region's bringing forward to the province, and we're just showing our support. So I got Councillor Ganan and then I have Councillor Chambetta. Yeah. So, so further to that, I, I, I think pretty much, Mr. Chair, you just said exactly what I was going to say. I, I certainly support the, the report that, that our staff put forward and, and they, they, they found the flaws from their perspective. And I really support that the region has gone to bat. My point in speaking about the other is it's the areas that were already pointed out as being negative regarding this um, are not the only areas where, where it falls down in my eyes. And so, um, so certainly I think that, that the region has done a really good job in terms of actually supporting the kinds of things that Mr. Treble had spoken to us about as well. So uh, I just want to clarify that, that I just think there's more that's wrong <laughs> above and beyond what the region is saying. So thank you. All right, I'll go to Councillor Trembetta. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think some of the issues that come from this, I guess, motion, I guess I, I can see us receiving it for information, but the problem is the support from for the Niagara region, I think that's what's probably getting some members of council here, is that, I don't know, I, I know because in the in the report, Brian, you did say there's more information to come, so I'm, I'm kind of confused on that, so maybe you can just explain a bit through you, Mr. Chair, to Mr. Treble. Yep. So you're muted, Mr. Uh, Director. I sound better that way. Uh, for uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to uh, to Councillor Trombetta. Uh, yeah, I indicated that there would be more to come because uh, there is discussion occurring around the planning table about ways to attempt to address the timelines, for example, and um, those. You know, assuming that Bill 109 stands then we have to do something to see if we can't um, uh, be more efficient and more timely in our, in our review processes. Uh, some of that is going to probably require that the applicants complete some of the work with some of the external agencies before they even bring a planning application to us so that it already has received, for example, comments from the Conservation Authority or even Public Works in some respects, depending on what the nature of the application is. So uh, in terms of process, Mr. Chair, I foresee bringing back some reports to talk about how we're going to strategically attempt to implement some of the, so, the changes that have been presented to us. Through you, Mr. Chair, to Mr. Trouble. So with more information coming back, can we not just receive this for information purposes? Does our region Niagara need the full support of this letter this evening? Um, I haven't had a direct discussion with the region, uh, but I think the reality is if we can show support to the region who is expressing concerns on our behalf to the province, it's, it's not a bad thing to do. I don't think there's any harm in doing that. Um, the question, I guess, becomes whether or not this is a bill that we have to live with or after June 2nd, is it something that could end up being repealed? I have no idea at this point. It depends on what happens on June 2nd being election day, I would assume. Okay. Again, I think it's just 
I guess for my mind frame and the way it's written and what your report states in the back of the conclusion, it's kind of I'm a little bit torn, but I'm not saying it wasn't written incorrectly, Brian. I understand there's, there's more information to come, which is kind of I'm a little bit torn by. Anyways, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I have Mayor Bilsma. And Council Yonker, did you have your hand up, sir? You might have had your hand up first. Okay, never mind. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I just wanted to uh, um, uh, say uh, I'm in, in favor of our council supporting a letter that the Niagara Region is sending addressing concerns that they have on this bill. And I think it's it's just a question of having something on the record saying that we're not pleased with with, with this. Somewhere, um, you know, I, I guess if it's just even for the big giant, I told you so, um, you know, really, you know, just, just to say, you know, that, that there was, we had addressed concerns. I would also put forward um, uh, the simple um, uh, observation of how um, I see this current provincial government generally operates. They like to throw... Uh, something uh, quite grandiose at the wall, almost to see what sticks. And then they have a, um, a record of walking back quite substantially on, on many of their policies. And I think that perhaps um, doing the bums rush on, on this to, to kind of get it out into the public dialogue to see if there is indeed anybody paying attention or awake or having a concerns is perhaps maybe... Um, um, a little bit more of a, an aggressive way to uh, uh, get responses back that are um, um, perhaps a little leaner or a little bit more efficient. I don't know. It, it, politics is a crazy world. I've come to realize that. So I, I think that if that's the, what we've been observing, the uh, uh, modus operandi of, of the current government, that they like to, to throw some bombast out there and see what, see, see what kind of um, rhetoric it generates. I think then we need to kind of play by the rules as much as we may be um, uh, reticent to do so. I think it's at this is at the juncture to, you know, as, as Council Rayner has pointed out, if they've circumvented some of the process, perhaps, you know, they might listen in retrospect. So let's, for the purposes of our own conscience, let's get something on the record saying that, you know, these are some of our uh, objections and then move forward. Thanks, Mr. Chair. No problem. Um, not seeing any other members, I'll, I'll make a comment as well. And I and I agree. I, I think when whatever the thought process was behind rushing this out was certainly, um, as I said earlier, like a knee jerk reaction. Um, what their intentions were by doing it, I guess you know we'll find out in the future. But I, I think we need to like. This needs to be corrected. Like this cost implication on the taxpayer is going to be astronomical. Like essentially, with no pause button, where if the, once staff goes forward and identifies certain concerns or whatever is in the the process there through the planning stages, if they can hold it up to the night before, if they submit it back, knowing staff has no way of responding, then these built these developers are literally going to just end up with all their money in, some in the pocket, and it's going to be the community now carrying the weight of these builds, and it's going to add more animosity and more divide um, between government uh, developers and the residents. So I, this certainly needs to be dealt with and addressed, and I hope that we can actually also put forward... Um, We've been using this a lot in the last, I feel like, the few weeks there, but I feel we need to address this also through a delegation, another matter that we, we can't let... Um, go unheard and even if the next term you know even if we're talking about june 2nd there in the election and things could change we know you know whatever gets changed it certainly isn't going to be changed immediately and by the time this starts to roll out um could, the, the, there could be a moment of where we're having to deal with this or we're having to go and hire more staff or whatever is necessary to comply within that uh those rules or boundaries but anyways mr mayor i see your hand up i'll let you yeah so thank you mr chair and a thought occurred to me and a, and a question generated from that thought uh, to the director of planning, are we not? Are we in the driver's seat that we need to take up a, a planning application? Are we obligated to receive a planning application? Because under these new rules, if it's going to cost us, we can't conceivably operate under those rules. Can we just reject them at the door and let the planners, uh, let the developers go to the province and do some bidding and say, look, now the municipalities have shut us down because they don't want to be um, caught uh, between an unrealistic uh, timelines. And so. Do, are we obligated to take all planning applications? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, it's a very good question, Mr. Mayor. It's actually a question that that uh, we discussed at our, our um, planning agenda 
uh, discussion last week just to get a, you know, sort of a feel for it. I, I have one potential application that I'm anticipating could be received in the next couple of months. And, and it's one where I would be more than happy to take a position to say we refuse to process. Um, having said that, though, I, I probably want to have a discussion with Township Legal Counsel around some of the ramifications of that position and, and potential cost consequences if we end up before the OLT. So it's yeah. one we're investigating, investigating Mr. Mayor, and, and uh, I'll certainly be happy to flush that out, especially if I have an application that, that may end up on the table and we may want to take just that exact approach. So Okay. Um, yeah, no, I yeah. just I just want to make that. sure that we understand that, you know, municipalities have taken um, a little bit of civil disobedience from time to time uh, to task. And, and uh, so we, it, it, if it's somewhat on the table or we can explore it, then, then uh, you know, uh, I, I'd hate to go that way, which is why I think it's very important to support the letter here tonight. So thank you, Mr. Chair, no further. Well, thank you, and I, and, I, and I agree. You know, unfortunately, we don't have to get to that kind of theater uh, as far as trying to exhaust it through the OLT to get the province to pay attention. So hopefully we can get this resolved before this becomes a real issue. I'm not seeing any other questions or comments. I'm going to call the vote. And again, the vote is just, I'm going to read it again, that the, they're receiving for information purposes and that we are supporting that the township hereby notify the region of Niagara of their support for the region's letter regarding response to more homes for everyone act 2022. Provincial Bill 109 dated April 29, 2022 as found as in attachment one to this report. So all with that being said, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? All right. And oppose? Not seeing any. Excellent. So that carries. So we're going to move forward here uh, to, okay, item P5122, Building Inspector and Bylaw Enforcement Officer John Bartle and Director of Planning and Building Brian Treble and its recommendation report PD52-2020, Peter by Development Inc., Site Alteration Application for Station Metals West, Phase one, number 3000-0222, and the recommendation is that report PD-5222 regarding the recommendation report, uh, PBUD Development Inc., site alteration application for Station Metals West. Phase one, number 3000-0222, dated May 9th, 2022, be received. And that an authorizing bylaw as found at attachment two to this report be passed to permit the mayor and Clerk to sign a site alteration agreement in draft form as found at attachment three and during compliance with the draft approved plan of subdivision as well as the conditions set out in this report and draft site alteration permit. And three, that all report, all efforts would be taken by the owner to acknowledge and protect neighboring residents, including but not limited to dust control, speed control, noise control, obedience of the highway or abeyance of the highway, sorry. Uh, traffic Act, etc. Failure to do so will provide enforcement staff with authority to revoke this permit at any time. So I'm going to need a mover. And I got Councillor Ganan, I got Councillor Yonkers, my seconder. Any questions or comments? Not seeing or hearing any, I'll call the question. All those in favor? And any opposed? All right, that carries. So now we're going to move to other business. Under other business, we have uh, our deputy clerk has some correspondence in multi wind. I'm sorry, multi municipal wind turbine working group, also known as MMWT uh, WG 2022 membership renewal. Assuming that's a membership renewal fee, uh, that the correspondence regarding the multi municipal wind turbine working group MMWT WG 2022 membership renewal dated April 29, 2022, be received and dot dot dot. So I'm going to need a mover and a seconder for that. I have Councillor Rayner as a mover, Councillor Trombetta as a seconder. Um, any questions, or sorry, I guess I'll go to Councillor Trombetta first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's kind of fitting, I guess, that this is coming again. And about eight years ago, we, we ran in an election. That, that's all we were dealing with, myself, uh, the mayor, and uh, Councillor Rayner at that time. We've came a long way since eight years um, I just want to know, I'm not, I'm not against the, the membership renewal. It's a small amount. I just uh, want to know where are we at with this stuff. I've known some letters have been written. Uh, it's been quite quiet. I understand there's obviously a different government that was in, in power at that time when we got all these put down our throat at the, in our municipality. That's the way I want to say it. I'm sorry because it was a tough time eight years ago if I remember. Um, where are we, uh, 
where are we at with, I've known, that I was reading in some of the uh, agenda that there's forces for letters for bigger setbacks and all that kind of stuff that was in the agenda, but if anybody's on this group or can talk to, maybe Mr. Treble or Jessica or Mrs. Dyson. So, so what specifically are you hoping? Well, where are we at? Like, we're still doing the membership renewal. Where are we at? Is anything, any so, new received information has changed? Is, is these going to be kind of decommissioned in the future? What's, maybe somebody can touch upon that who's on the board or something like that, I'm all thinking. Right. All right. I'll go to Councillor uh, Yonker. Yeah, yeah, that would be uh, me and uh, myself and, 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 and the mayor that are on that, uh, on this uh, committee. And we do find that it has been a little bit quiet. Obviously, COVID has uh, affected how we can get, to, get together, but the, the, the group is back um, at it. They had, um, and I think I would, I, I, I'm, I'll just keep it simple. I think we need to stay in this group. And the reason why is because of the regulations that are continually and constantly changing. We can, uh, in, in, in six months, we will have maybe a, a new government and it, it, the rules will change and it's pretty hard to keep up with it. This group does an excellent job of, of, of keeping an eye on stuff like that as well as being a spokes uh, group for us. And decommissioning of these things is going to be a big issue that's going to come up and and i think this group keeps an eye on that as well so i see benefits in staying involved and i do know i think they do have a couple new members that just came on board so there's um definitely some some of the members have maybe dropped off but i think as a whole the, the group is still the same and there's a few that have joined as as they get a, a, a farm wind by, uh, wind turbine farm on in their municipality so I, i'm in favor of staying involved and just decommissioning has been a big issue and actually even breakdowns and, and incidences and, and that's what they've actually been working on a little bit more um uh, looking for reports on how many fires stuff like that there's those are pretty tall buildings if you want to call them buildings in our municipality and how they're going to be dealt with if they catch fire and stuff like that. So a lot of work they're still doing. So I think it's still worth it. That yeah, that's good. Yeah. Let them, the mayor needs to have his right. hand up. That's fine. You got your mic on still. Yeah. All right. Council. Sorry. Did I, you, mayor Bilsman, do you have your hand up? Yeah. Thank you. And, and so I, I'm glad that councilor uh, Jonker mentioned about the decommissioning, but what we also uh, are noticing is that some of the, um, wind turbines are experiencing like fatigue. They've been in production for, you know, uh, well more than 15 years. Uh, they are slated to be decommissioned of some sort, but they're actually, um, you know, there's some safety concerns. Some of them are failing um, as well. And, and so how, how we deal with, uh, how, how we're going to deal with that um, in terms of, you know, uh, maybe increased uh, safety reporting. And, um, and then the final, uh, uh, in, in addition to, um, uh, uh, decommissioning, I, I would say that one of the bright spots as I follow the notes that they've been really working on and has changed since our um, municipality received the wind for farms is a, a direct correlation to setbacks to the size of the, uh, the, the units. Back in the day, and Councillor Trombetta will remember this, but 550 meters was the setback, whether it was a three megawatt or whether it was a half a megawatt. And, and now um, there's been great headway because of this group continuing to advocate for reasonableness and common sense that as the um, increase uh, of megawatts are being produced by a particular unit uh, that has a, a, a larger setback to um, uh, uh, non-participating neighbors. So I, I think it's an example of, of their continuous ag advocacy and uh, the credibility that they are because they're a group of municipalities. So uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right. I'm going to – oh, sorry. Go ahead, Councillor Yonker. Yeah, sorry. So can – I'm not sure if this is the right time to do it. So can we add on there and that we renew our membership? Yeah, you can add that at any time. So, are you, so are you would like to add that at this time? Yes, be okay. received, and that we uh, inform staff to re, okay. uh, renew our membership. So, my move. And I'll move that. Okay, so 
I don't remember who the original movers were. If, I don't think we I, need a separate mover, but oh, that's right. I, whoever the I, think, I was the second. I think it was Cal, I think it was Councilor Rayner and Councilor Trimbetta were the mover and seconders. So assuming that's okay, if you could just nod your heads, okay. Oh, I see a head shake. So I'll go to Councilor Rayner. Because we might. Yes, um, it's our. Um, for you, Mr. Chair, it already mentions membership renewal. So when you normally have a situation like this, it said be received and if you want it, you normally just say received and supported. So I believe that would be the word that, that Councilor Yonker is okay. looking for that was normally used in a situation like this if you want something to go forward. Okay. And received support. Okay. And so I'm hearing that. I'm going to go to our deputy clerk first just to make sure um, Dennis correctly. Do I... If, do I need to change? Do I need to go back to the original mover and secretary to make sure they support it as it's being read now? Okay. So, Councillor Rainer, I just want to confirm um, you're okay with it being received and supported. Okay, I see that, and so that still keeps it on the floor there. Um, at this point, I'll go around and see if there's any other comments or questions. Um, not seeing any. I do have a question for staff myself. Um, what is the benefit? Uh, I realize the amount of money they're asking for is very minimal. Uh, considering especially what we, we, we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. But I'm just curious, what is the benefit um, of, from, I guess, the municipality's standpoint of having us remain on this? And do we have to remain on this as a municipality, or could certain members of committee uh, elect to join it themselves at their own expense? No. So I'll go to the director of planning. I see him pop up there. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, I believe it's the, the municipality that is meant to be the member, uh, and then you, you appoint one uh, person to be your spokesperson, and, and I think an alternate is, is uh, requested as well. That's the way I recall it being. Um, and from, a, from my perspective, there is benefit in um, all of the work that is being done by that group in terms of, of policy and uh, and that kind of, of thing in terms of you know sort of the latest and, and greatest in terms of what's happening across the world and and specifically as as was mentioned with some of the the turbine failures and and what that leads to so uh, i certainly see benefit from a policy perspective in in terms of staying in touch and, and aware of what they have to say and the research they're doing okay and a follow-up so if for whatever reason we were not to be a part of it would we be excluded for that information or is this really just an opportunity to have somebody um, from a municipality just kind of sit on the board there and um, and provide I guess just direction under their recommendation of policy because they have no governing authority uh, they're an advocacy advocacy group right so I'm just trying to understand um, the real benefits to the taxpayers here I guess my my thought off the top, Mr. Chair, is that we certainly have a, a chair at the table by being a member and then have input into the process that way. Um, and I believe that they are connected in some way to Wind Concerns Ontario, which is a sort of a lobby type group that that uh, influences the provincial government. So I think there are some some uh, benefits to being at the table, I believe, but I could be wrong. I believe that Wind Concerns Ontario does generally make their stuff available broadly anyway. Um, so we would certainly find out about stuff, uh, I believe, but if we weren't at the table, but I think there's value in sitting at that table and having input into the... Perfect, that's the just what I wanted to hear. As long as there's value there, we certainly have plenty of those hosted in our community. So I just wanted to make sure we're getting the most out of our buck there. So I have no problem supporting this as well. So at this point, not seeing any other questions or comments, I will call the vote. All those in favor? And that carries. Excellent. So that, uh, that passes there. I'm going to move forward to members of the committee, um, other business matters of informative nature. Any, I have our Madam CEO I'll start with. Oh, I see your hand up, so. My hand is up, but I think it's not, it doesn't fit this. I do need to speak to the invasive species item at an appropriate time. Okay, I, yeah, I, I don't see any other members a hand up, so if you'd like to speak to that now, I'll permit that. No, it's a little unorthodox, but I don't think it's a big deal. I can make that exception for you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so um, as, as things happen, um, I mean, it's been brought to my attention that um, yeah, there was a report in January um, on the, that related to the, the, um, the topic of the invasive species. It was PDO 4 2022 regarding um, 
the um, letter of support. So they're asking the group that came tonight, Karen Alexander's group asked for um, a letter of support back in um, the, the late last year and um, our planner Garrett Borma wrote a report on it. Um, the recommendation that went through was that the, um, th that the um, as you can see, I'm reading it, the committee and council authorized Mayor and Clerk to sign the attached supporting letter and that staff give that letter to the invasive species um, center. So the reason why I'm raising this is that we have taken some action already. I think what is being um, asked of, of staff following upon that is more a little bit more detail about how we can support. So I, I'll either go to um, uh, our director or to our planner, um, Garrett, to speak to this, please. Okay, I'll go to uh, Director Treble. I, uh, three, Mr. Chair, I can, I can start and Garrett can certainly fill in a much more detail. Um, as I recall, at the time we were approached by uh, um, Karen to uh, support a funding request application that had gone out, um, but our timing was off, so the letter of support did not get received in time to go in with their funding applications. That's kind of my recollection, but I believe there was more in terms of detail at that point, even around uh, contacting the adjacent property owners and stuff. So. I'll turn it over to Garrett to, to go further. All right. Thank you, uh, Brian. So through the chair, um, <clears throat> there were actually two funding applications and two requests for letters. So we missed the deadline for the first, their first funding application, but we did manage to get that report in in time to have a letter signed for their second application. And at that time, they also asked for assistance in um, notifying property owners along the creek or along the Welland River. So we added that as a recommendation in that PD4 report as well, that we would help them with some administration tasks where it was possible. Uh, but what uh, Ms. Alexander mentioned tonight about um, putting the uh, plants to compost on the, um, I'm assuming the community center site there, uh, that's a little bit new information that we didn't really contemplate in that January report. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to, so I guess I'm gonna go back to our MCO. So what would you like us to, to, to do at this point, I guess is what I'm looking for. I, I, thank you for the question. I don't think we have to do anything, but I wanted to okay. um, make sure that council was aware of, or sorry, committee was aware of the action that was taken to date so that we are being very transparent. Okay, no, and I appreciate that. I guess maybe that's part of even my confusion of trying to figure out, I, I know you're just putting it because it was on the record and more on the record now as if we're not seeing this for the first time. Um, again, it wasn't it kind of sound a little like you guys were trying to figure out if we need to change what we originally approved, which is what I was getting at. So it doesn't sound like it. And uh, I certainly appreciate that extra information. So with that being said, uh, I'm gonna go back, or just take one last look, see if any members of the committee have anything to add, not seeing or hearing any. I'm gonna go if there's any new business to bring forward, not seeing or hearing any. Uh, no confidential matters tonight. So at this point, I'm gonna adjourn tonight's meeting at the hour of 8.29 p.m. Have a good night, everybody, and thanks for watching.